Now what I'll be doing in the first section of the actual demonstration video is again this is the same as, as what we did in class marking out where the bony landmarks are um, and I'm going for bony landmarks but also kind of you know let's say the head of the humerus there that's a bony-ish landmark it's not it's not a bony landmark because it's covered by the deltoid but uh, is relevant for us to keep track of but most of the things I've painted in here you see that's painting in roughly where a scapula is um, actually looks like that should come that should come out further but anyway yeah, I guess I was, I was probably a little bit too sketchy on that. It's not going to hurt to spend some time and really figure out where the landmarks are because it's also going to you know, help reinforce your own knowledge of human anatomy and then, by extension, animal anatomy when we, when we get into that. Now, the idea is, is that when you, when you morph it, you're keeping track of those landmarks so they're in the same, the same place. You can see, as I've... As I move through with this, there are a couple of places where I haven't been able to keep track of this because, see that that's where I that's where the rib cage is on the on the human. That's where it is on the horse. If you guys can can keep track of those marks better, then it's just going to be, um, like let's say a more fun end result or a more relevant end result because you can see how that bone moves from one position into the other. And it's you know what I want to see from you guys is to see that you can you can really understand that and that you're not just sculpting a human and then sculpting a horse and not thinking about the the differences between those because in understanding the differences you then understand the similarities so it's it's two sides of the same coin and if you can figure that out if you can get your head around that then it's really like you look at a horse you look at a lion you look at a human or a crocodile or a, or a fish even there's it's the same language you know and it it'll, will just vary depending on evolutionary and, and environmental factors but if I turn the poly paint off through here, um, you're going to see. Well, we'll take a look at the legs actually, because that's that's probably the the easiest to see. And what what I really like about this process is that once you have it, it kind of makes it so obvious what the differences are. Like for for most people when they're starting out studying, it's not super obvious that that's the foot. It's not super obvious that that's the knee. But um, yeah, once you've gone through an exercise like this, it's like okay, no, I can I can see how that would how that would move into that position, um, and similar for the for the arms, like okay, so we've got scapula, we've got humerus. Notice by the way how how short, so there's there's the femur, how short those uh, bones are in a quadruped. We have very long upper limbs, uh, very long femurs, very long uh, humerus bones. That's to help us climb, or was to help us climb back when that was a, a necessity of survival. But you know, in a, in a quadruped, if those if those bones are really long and those joints are, are really uh, far from the body, there's going to be a lot less support, a lot less strength for those joints. So the the pattern of size becomes becomes different, right? It's it's actually more intuitive on a human. I think you start, uh, you know, your femur will be long, and then your tibia and fibula will be slightly shorter. Uh, your humerus is slightly shorter than that, and then your radius and ulna are shorter than that. It follows a clear pattern, whereas uh, whereas on a quadruped, it, it's not so obvious. Like you, you've got these short upper bones, and then and then they get longer uh, through you know, through the humerus and through the tibia and fibula. So let's just let's just go through these and, and make sure that we're super clear on on what is what and um, and the reasons and necessity for that. So, um, well, well, let's start with the big mo bony masses. I'm not going to talk about the head too much because that's. That's kind of its own beast, you know. In in the same way with uh, with the anat the CGMA anatomy course, I don't touch on the head because as soon as you open up that door, you double the length of the course. So um, we we will of course cover that, and there are some really interesting things in terms of the landmarks there to cover. But um, it's not really affecting like the the shape of the body, let's say. So I'm going to move straight onto the onto the rib cage through there, and obviously the first thing you can notice is that is a massive rib cage. Right? Do you think for a horse it's just it's a big creature it's got a lot of it needs to get a lot of uh, oxygen into its blood so it needs to do a lot of breathing especially when it's when it's running so from the side view what we're looking at is still egg shaped right eggs will still help us 
all the time and egg is always like your, your get out of jail free card in anatomy if in doubt just make it like an egg and you'll get away with it it works for michelangelo so it'll probably work for you um but just bear in mind from the front view how thin that is so with the human rib cage that egg shape that we're looking for we go mostly for an egg but then we flatten it a little bit from front to back um and on a quadruped you know like for, because it's got to sprint forward it's got to be fa fairly aerodynamic that that becomes really uh, very very narrow very thin especially as it gets towards the front and dives underneath the scapula the widest point of the rib cage is going to be fairly similar to where it would be on a human right on a human that uh, towards the bottom that's that's where it swells out about the eighth rib which you know we have we have 12 ribs of so those we're mainly interested just just in 10 not in the floating ribs and uh and yeah so we have our widest point you know sim similar to to uh yeah, very similar to a quadruped, round right about there. So that idea stays the same. You just gotta, you just gotta squash the hell out of it from the, from the the top view and the, and the front view, and yeah, really look at how much that tapers. So the fullness through there, can be really quite full. I actually looking at this here, I'm feeling like you can find more roundedness. You really, you really, especially in a horse, feel the barrel shape of that rib cage, and but then it then it tapers a lot as it dives underneath the scapula. It's like look how narrow that point is, and that's. You know that's pretty much the the, the top of the rib cage, and then notice how the the rib cage is kind of sagging down a bit, right? It's not it's not hitting a straight vertical. There's a bit of an angle to it there. Uh, generally, most things won't hit a vertical. Most things, sorry, horizontal. I have a tendency to get those those things confused. Um, yeah, generally, most things won't hit a hit a horizontal or a vertical, but we will make them that way because. Uh, we tend to make things more safer and more architectural because we have a natural tendency to avoid chaotic things because because that's too like nature that's too like things that will kill us so for the vast majority of us when we're doing a leg we tend to make it much more vertical than it is um, and yeah when we're doing something like a, a body like this we'll tend to make it much much more horizontal and you're going to have that tendency whether you're doing human or or animal anatomy probably if that is a, a natural tendency of yours um <clears throat> so just bear in mind that that is not a uh, a horizontal movement and that the movement is not the same as uh, on a human at all so on a human let's switch it up notice the movement of the spine right it's i mean this guy has a he carries his head quite far forwards uh more than yeah more than let's say would be uh a really good posture but it, it's still really noticeable this curvature of the spine so the spine is curving in to the middle of the head right to support the weight of the cranium then you've got the rib cage and the spine comes deep inside the body to support the weight of the rib cage and head and then you know what's left of our like vestigial tail the bottom of the the, the sacrum and the, the cossack through there that curves even more so what you have on a human being is this very noticeable, very human S curve, uh, which is there? Everything is there for a functional reason, right? Form follows function, um, so it's it's a very elegant, very beautiful curve. Generally, even more elegant in the female figure because the hips push back so much because of the the angle of the hip bones and and the fat as well of the hips. Um, and in a quadruped, it's it's a it's a different it's a different movement. Why? Because it's, it's a completely different structure, right? You're, you're supporting, when I say completely different structure, it's the same bones, more or less, but um, but the weight is distributed through here. So what we have is we have a need to carry the weight right through the middle because, you know, we're just carrying it on two points, whereas in a quadruped, it's four points. So you literally have, like, these the, the spine through here. Oh, sorry, the spine's going to be much deeper in the neck. Spine, something like that. And the hips and the rib cage literally hanging off there so you don't have the spine dropping down so much to support that and so then you can see like the areas that do support that so the shoulder girdle through here and the thighs through there are just massively more muscular than they would be on a human because you've got a whole bunch of weight to support that so we've got this downward movement through here we then rise up towards the hips so relatively large distance there between the rib cage and hips uh, more than there would be on a human but less than there would be on a quadruped predator like a 
like a, um, a big cat, well, or any cat, um, or a dog or something like that, well, especially a cat where they so, um, so flexible through the hips, through there, sorry, through the, the spine, through there. And in order to have that flexibility, you need a, a healthy sort of distance between the rib cage and hips. So, uh, so that, that's the thing to look out for. What is, what is that distance? And on a human, especially on a male, uh, that, that distance can be really short. Let's take a look at it on this guy. So here's the bottom of his 10th rib. The floating ribs are going to be to about there. And the top of his rib cage is not that, right? That's obliques of his rib cage rising underneath that. So look at how small that distance is, right? Everyone has a tendency to, to overplay that distance in the human. So keep an eye out for it. Um, but in a quadruped, you can overplay it and, and you'll get away with it. So generally speaking, the bigger the distance is between the, the rib cage and the hips, the more flexible you're going to be through the, through the spine. And women tend to be more flexible in that way than men. So it works in humans as well. Um, Michael uh, Michelangelo, Michael Jackson, very different. There was that rumor that he had uh, two ribs taken out to give himself extra flexibility through there for personal gratification. Uh, I, I doubt that's true, but it would probably work. Now, as we move from the spine into the hips and the spine, remember, being pretty close to the surface through there, right? The spine on a human really buried inside the body. So the front portion, the, the hide his arms the frontmost portion of his spine probably close to there maybe not quite that but close to halfway through his body right and that's something that I correct on human sculpts all the time like don't think if the spine is hanging out the back because that's going to make it a, a very ineffective support think about it as being buried inside the body but as we've spoken about on the on the quadruped it's not it's not the main uh, bearer of the weight so the spine is is close to the top and you know actually like I think I can probably push this further to illustrate this. The, the spiniest processes, the, you know, the spines of, the, of each vertebrae, you know, the bits that stick out, that's going to be pretty noticeable through the top here. So you're going you're gonna to see that there, and you're sure as hell going to see it through there, right? Um, so this is going to be really pronounced through here. Um, and this, the bigger the neck is on the animal, the more pronounced this is. Um, I'm not going to go into that in too much detail, but it's, it's due to the nuchal ligament, which is basically a ligament that suspends the head and stops you needing to use so much energy to hold the head up. We, we have one as well in the human, and, um, and that's why you don't, you don't see like C6 or C1 to C6. Right, there's C7. You're not seeing those vertebrae there because we have the ligament that is holding the head upright. If our head gets bigger, like it would on a horse, the more weight that we would carry through there, the more of a counterbalance you're going to need through there. So those two things are directly connected. Okay, so that gives us the idea of the spine and then the hips. What's that? Hopefully you know that's the asis, which looks like I haven't kept track of that very well in my sculpt. So that's the asis on him. Yeah, so if I'm, if I'm keeping all the geometry in the exact same position, then this all needs to shoot up. But I'm going to ignore that and trust that you're intelligent to go, okay, that point there is not that point, it's that point there. So what happens in the quadruped is, and well, we are fairly unique in as much as, you know, we're standing upright. And so we need kind of this wide platform to, to hold that weight. If you look at other apes that don't spend so much of their time upright, the hips are very, very narrow, right? You get something like that. And in a quadruped where they're not holding much weight at all, they get super narrow. So essentially, that's what we're looking at. It's just a, it's just a box shape through there. So here's the Asus, right? Really important bony landmark on a human really, really important bony landmark on, uh, on a quadruped. Like especially the, those, um, like the skinny guys that you'll see in nature, like, you know, sometimes often on cows, you really see it where they just don't have an ounce of fat on them. And this becomes like the most noticeable landmark in the world. Um, and then the spine, like we said, just not buried at all within the skin, actually protruding significantly out from there. So if we look at the angle of the hips, it's gonna be something like this bonk bonk or if we just simplify that into one angle 
uh, something like that. So you can see how much the spine is sticking out from there. So from the back view, you can look at this as a, as a triangle if you want to. You know, or you can just start with a box and work from there because, like I say, the hips are much more box-like than human hip. So asis, and then back here, this, th th this bit of bone sticking out there, that, uh, that's the ischium. And that's like, we, ha we have that in the human as well. Kind of where I've drawn it, actually, where, where it is on the quadruped, something like that. If we, if we draw his hips in, chop his hands off. Okay, so hip rising up, coming down, something like that. That's going to be the acetabulum. And sacrum doing something like that. And then, and then we'd have this ischium bone down here, right? Which, if you're sat down watching this, you can, you can feel under your bum and you'll, you'll feel that. And if you've got fairly pliable gluteal muscles, you'll probably be sitting more or less directly on that. Sometimes in a yoga class, they'll ask you to, to pull your cheeks apart, which is so that that is not um, weighing on the, on the gluteus maximus, on the, on the gluteal muscle through there. Um, but it's generally not impacting the surface form, right? It, it will do in a subtle way and it'll do in a much more noticeable way if the leg starts to bend. So here it's like, like let's say the, the femur is bending 90 degrees or more than that, then suddenly the muscle is going to get pulled tight over there and that's going to push outwards. Well, if we look at this guy sideways, then you can see like if his leg dropped down, then that would be what? Like this, right? So here, because, you know, the, like if we draw in the femur, the, the point of articulation is going to be there, great trochanter, something like that, right? Draw in there, you, and, and then the ischium poking out through there. Well, you can see that this is getting pulled tight around there. So um, this angle break then becomes much more noticeable. So the, it's, it's, not a, it's not a true bony landmark, though, right? Because there's muscle on top of it. So uh, through here, the, the asis is... The, the only place that I would say is like a really true bony landmark of the hips uh, in the quadruped because even the great trochanter which is you know super important in the human it's going to be somewhere like that um, and it's big it's big in quadruped and it will impact the form like I, I feel like I should really push this out more to capture that but it's not it's not a bony landmark it is covered by muscle in the quadruped so yeah so I still want to find it because any opportunity you can to find bone is magic um, and super important but yeah just just worth bearing in mind that is not a, a true bony landmark so rib cage hips spine with these great big spinous processes really so the, the spine itself bottom of the spine might be there or the spinal column might be something like that but then yeah you have these spinous processes sticking out quite a distance and do you know what? I feel like I can actually carve this in more through here because, yeah, the rib cage is going to be somewhere like this. And then this is all spine, spine, but you know, not the body of the spine, but those vertebrae sticking out the top. And then through here, spine is, it ha has an S curve to it, like that, but. Uh, but look, this is all meat, right? This is all meat. So you look at a quadruped moving and that, and that um, neck is going to be flapping all over the place because it's just juddery. Really important to, to know that. I remember doing some, uh, some horses for the, the Hercules film with the rock and just spending a long time looking at and where, they, where they jiggle. But it, it's actually kind of obvious. It's, it's actually kind of obvious if you look at where the, the main meat masses are. So like through the thighs there, and there'll be a little bit through there, and then there'll be a huge amount through there because there's, n there's not much skeletal support there. Whereas like if you start to put jiggle through there, then you're gonna just break the, the quadruped or break the feeling of strength. So, you know, just a, an example of like how, when you understand these things, those solutions become really obvious because because you're thinking about things from a, from a point of view of, of function. Well, I digress, that's enough for this video. In the next video, we'll look at the head, the shoulder girdle, and the limbs.